Hello and welcome back to the Would You Give Me a Stay Chant podcast. My name is Toby Baton and today on the podcast we have an extremely special guest. I had the unique honor and privilege of interviewing Academy Award nominated filmmaker Joshua Seftel. Joshua Seftel is a true full stack filmmaker in that he's worked in a variety of mediums and platforms, from radio to reality TV to documentary and narrative films. His documentaries feature themes and topics such as social impact and change, and he also focuses a lot on the humanitarian aspect of society and depicts that in his films which i really admire and respect getting in contact with him and interviewing him for this podcast really is kind of a full circle moment for me my first introduction to his work was from the documentary it's the hard knock life which was made in 2013. i remember watching this documentary on youtube and completely fixating on it for a hot second and i would just watch it on loop and this is one of the first documentaries i watched that really made me start to enjoy and appreciate documentaries as a type of film i'd say that when i first started to develop an interest in film i watched a lot of different kinds of films but i would often watch documentaries um because i felt like those were slightly more accessible and i didn't really know like a ton of I hadn't really developed my, like, artistic taste in films other than films that I had grown up watching, films that were around the house, films that were just on TV. But I watched this documentary on YouTube when I was probably 12 or something, and I remember completely fixating on it and watching it multiple times. And I loved it, and the documentary is about the Tony-nominated revival of Annie on Broadway. And it is honestly one of my favorite documentaries to this day. In this episode, I speak to Joshua Seftel about working in documentary, narrative film, reality TV, and radio, and about how these different mediums can bridge the gap between disparate groups. Thanks for listening. I was researching your work, and actually, I the first thing I ever saw of you was probably when I was like eight or nine, and it was your documentary, It's the Hard Knock Life, um, and I was like looking you up, and I realized that you had directed that, and I was totally blown away because that, I think, is one of the first documentaries I watched that like really made me into documentaries, especially coming from a dance background. I, I grew up in dance, um, but um, that's not where I want to start. So, but do, do you want me to touch on my Tufts experience? Is that, yeah. is that helpful or more relevant? Yeah. Or, you know, I used to, da- I used to dance too. Um, oh, when, oh. when I was at Tufts, I did a lot of dance. Um, I was in a lot of performances and Mostly so modern cool. modern dance and African dance. Oh, nice, uh, amazing. Well, yeah, my parents are Nigerian, but I didn't ever. I never did African dance, but I grew up watching a lot of it. Um, so I just want to start um, first by having you introduce yourself, talk, and talk about how you got into film, specifically uh, documentary. Sure. Um, so when I was growing up, I had. I had dyslexia or some kind of learning disability where I had trouble reading. So, you know, it was, school was hard. And I found that the way I learned best was from watching uh, film, movies and documentaries. So when, when my dad would take us to the library, me and my sisters, you know, my sisters would get a stack of books and I would get a stack of VHS tapes and I would take those home and watch them on our VCR and I'd pick, you know, all kinds of topics and things I wanted to learn about, you know, different documentaries about history, art, um, culture, whatever, whatever the library had. And that was the beginning of my sort of exposure to documentaries and, and learning from them. Later on, when I was at at Tufts, uh, you know, as an undergrad, 
I was studying um, French literature and I had a particularly particular interest in film. You know, I was for one semester I was living in Paris and I would go to movies all the time, you know, and um, and I started to get really interested in that and that the idea of pursuing that. So when I came back from France back to Medford, I you know, I had this professor, this French professor who was um, retiring. His name was Seymour Simchez, and he was like a kind of a legendary Tufts professor. And to honor him, I decided I was going to make a documentary about his life. So, you know, I, I didn't know anything about it, really, but I and I hadn't studied film. But I figured out by, you know, borrowing a video camera and talking to a few people, I figured out how to make a, a sort of a rudimentary documentary. And I interviewed a bunch of people, a bunch of professors, um, including Saul Gittleman, who used to be the, the provost of, of Tufts, and uh, made this little documentary. And it was shown at the library uh, at, um, you know, what used to be called the Wessel Library, I think it's now called the Tisch Library. And, you know, we showed it and um, a lot of professors came because they also loved Seymour. And, you know, a few weeks later, one of those professors approached me and said, um, you know, my husband, she, there was a, this woman named Connie Toth Berende. She was, a, I think, an Italian professor. And she approached me and said, you know, my husband is working to help the the, uh, Romani- the abandoned children of Romania. And he's starting a foundation. And, and she said, I wonder if you'd be interested in helping him to make a film about that subject. And it turned out that I, the, the fellowship I thought I was going to get <clears throat> that was going to take me to um, South Africa after I graduated um, fell through. <clears throat> so I suddenly had some free time and I decided that um, I would try to help him make a documentary about Romanian children. And that's that was really my first professional experience. I went to Romania and um, documented the conditions of the children who were abandoned in orphanages across the country and came back and somehow managed to pulled together a documentary with a, you know, I had $2,000 that I had raised and a lot of favors that I called in and was able to make this film, which ended up airing on public television. And that film led to the American adoption of thousands of Romanian children. And it, um, you know, it also was nominated for an Emmy and, uh, Suddenly, I, I, you know, thought about um, this idea that, wow, film making is really powerful. Uh, you can you can really have an impact, which was was my goal after college. And so, from that point forward, I continued to pursue filmmaking. Um, so something that I was really um, taken with, well, really struck me about your career is how you led with the humanitarian aspect and you still focus on the humanitarian aspect. A lot of your work shines uh, a light on individuals who are marginalized and othered. And I was wondering um, what made you motivate, like what motivated you to take this stance and not pursue like narrative filmmaking or um, something like that? Yeah, well, so I, in addition to being a French major, I was pre-med. And my plan was to, you know, not just go to medical school and become a doctor, but I wanted to become, like, a member of Doctors Without Borders, you know. And I wanted to travel the world and help people in need and have an impact, uh, what I thought was, you know, an impact. And when I decided to pursue filmmaking... Um, at the chagr- to the chagrin of my parents, um, they wanted me to be a doctor. I I felt this pressure, but also I felt an obligation to make films that would have 
a similar impact that I would have had if I had become a doctor and joined Doctors Without Borders. So I always felt that pressure to, um, to, to try to achieve that. So when I, you know, when I started out and I made the film in Romania, it was like, okay, yeah, this is the kind of work that I, I need to and should be doing. And over time, I've, you know, not every film I make has that kind of impact or it has that kind of direction and focus on humanitarian issues, but, but a lot of them do. Um, and it's because I've, it's because of that original idea that I was supposed to be a doctor and travel the world and help heal the world. So, you know, I guess there are other ways to heal the world. Um, and I hope that my filmmaking in some tiny, tiny way is helping to do that. Yeah, for sure. And I, especially going back to what you said about um, documentary and film itself being such a powerful art form, um, like I think documentary holds a very um, different power than a lot of like other genres of film. And um, I feel like when you think about film making in the West, it isn't really about the the you know the big topics of life, such as you know um, children who are orphaned and p- children who are in underdeveloped countries, and you know society is very different there than it is here in the West. And I was wondering, like you you've worked in ver- in a lot of different mediums, you know, in TV, in documentary. Um, what about documentary? Is it that you know really like works for you and um why do you lead with or lead with documentary as a medium well for one thing i mean i think it goes back to the that story about me going to the library you know and coming out with a stack of documentaries i think i i always felt an affinity toward documentary because that's how i learned about the world so the idea that I could make also make documentaries um, was very exciting to me. Um, it's how my brain worked anyway. It's how I absorbed information. So making them was just a, a, the next step in a way. Um, I also, you know, I think part of it also is that there, there's an accessibility um, to making documentary, especially today, but even even when I was coming up, there was, you know, there was this new kind of camera that had just come out. It was called a high eight camera and it was uh, affordable, relatively speaking, you know, you could buy one for a thousand dollars, um, as opposed to, you know, the professional cameras around that were around that were more like $50,000 at that time, you know? So, uh, I was using high eight cameras that I, um, would borrow from people. And the, the picture quality at that time was good enough, you know, that it could be broadcast. Today, it would not be. Um, but, you know, today you can use your iPhone and you can shoot in 4K and it looks really good, <laughs> you know. So it's it, there's an accessibility issue there that was appealing to me because I didn't have any money and I didn't have many connections and... Uh, I was still able to go out and make films. And, um, you know, it would have been a lot harder if I was working in, in narrative or other other mediums. Are there any documentaries that still stick with you today that you uh, want to mention or talk about, or directors even? Sure. I mean, my mentor, so I had a mentor, which, you know, it's important to mention because I didn't just go out there and start making films without any guidance. Uh, but I, I had a mentor who was also a Tufts grad named David Sutherland. And he was also a student of Seymour Simchez, the guy that I made the, my first film about, uh, you know, Seymour was the Tufts professor. And, um, so David, uh, Seymour introduced me to David Sutherland. And at the time, I would say David was probably in his early 40s. And he was very established. And 
I worked for him almost right out of college. And he became my mentor. And I was helping him make his films. And in turn, he would help me with mine in, in that he would give me advice and guidance and he'd watch my films and tell me how to make them better. And he, he connected me with lots of people who um, were able to, you know, help me get my films out into the world. So I never worked in a vacuum. And I think that would, that's a mistake. You know, if you can, you can't really do it on your own, especially with filmmaking it's such a collaborative medium, but really with anything, you you need a you need a community you need a network you need um, mentors I I can't stress that enough and so um, yeah so that was that was a a really important he was a very important person in early in my career and he's still making films today he's he's a really interesting guy he he's he lives in Boston in the Boston area and has made some amazing films like. Um, the the film that the films that really struck me he was making profiles of artists and one was called Jack Levine uh, Feast of Pure Reason and then he made a film about the artist Paul Cadmus and I and I would watch those films over and over and over again and just study like how did he do this how did he how did he frame these shots how did he make these edits and I would just watch over and over and over again and just that that was my film school was watching and just studying documentaries of people around me and uh, and so that so yeah his work was really important to me and then there was a there's a filmmaker named David Grubin that I really liked who uh in particular I loved a film he made about Lyndon Johnson the pre- uh the US president um and um and then a couple of other documentaries that meant a lot to me were um, Roger and Me, which was made by Michael Moore. And that was really one of Michael Moore's, I think, maybe his first film. Uh, I saw that in the movie theater, you know, I think I must have been in in college, um, early on in college. And that film kind of blew my mind because it was very fresh at the time you know it was it was like this guy just going around and talking to people and you know guiding taking us on a journey and it was very fresh and new now it would feel less so be you know that was a long time ago but it was um it was sort of a new way of telling stories in some sense and that was a really important film to me and he was very inspiring and then another filmmaker that I really was inspired by was Errol Morris. And he's also based in the Boston area. And, you know, he had this style where he, it was, his interviews were like very intense. And he had people looking directly into the lens of the camera when he was interviewing them. And he actually used this device called the Interatron. And that um, kind of gave the interviewee something to look at it was like a screen with Errol's face on it and Errol and they could see Errol talking to them and underneath the screen was the camera so um you know made it gave the appearance that the interviewee was looking directly into at the audience but the interviewee was actually talking to Errol on a, on what was essentially a teleprompter and now that's a very standard way of interviewing people of you like I'd say half the documentaries you watch people are looking directly into the lens and that's achieved by um, a device like that and we, we use that technique all the time with our with my films very enlightening to hear i know like for me personally i resonate with what you said about michael moore um because i remember being high school we had to do our own like research projects and i decided to do mine on uh teen gun violence and so naturally i watched bowling for columbine and i was kind of a you know i (laughs) i lingered every on like so many corners of the internet when i was a kid and i watched 
you know, so many DVDs and like film. I think that's what got me so interested in media. And I remember at first stumbling upon Bowling for Columbine when I was probably like 11 or 12. And I couldn't watch it because I was too scared. (laughs) And so then when that high school project came around, I just like had to, I just had to make myself watch it. And I remember being like so viscerally like affected for the next few days because of what he was depicting on screen and like I feel like he was ahead of his time in that sense and being a controversial figure but also a great filmmaker and a great artist wow yeah for sure that was a that film was huge and really important and uh yeah it was a different time back then when he was making his earlier films and you know there wasn't much else like it out there it was sort of pre it was kind of like pre-internet I think um, yeah. so it was a different time when that sort of personal perspective was really fresh and new. I mean, now you can just look at your phone and get thousands and thousands of personal perspectives on anything. Um, yeah. but at that time it was like, it was very original, uh, to, to include yourself Next thing I wanted uh, you to talk about was your experience in working in like the various aspects of film and TV that you have worked in from game shows to documentary feature films and like what each sector has taught you um, and how it's, you know, honed your skills as an artist and filmmaker. Yeah, well, I've had a uh, maybe an unusual career in some ways because I've I have worked in so many so many different spaces from kind of pure documentary to, um, you know, uh, radio and podcasts to um, reality shows to kids, a kid's game show, like you said, to um, commercials um, to, you know, movies and um yeah i've kind of worked in, worked in in almost every possible area of media um so it's been really exciting and ex- really you know never gets boring never gets boring the 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 funny thing is like several years ago when i was i remember i was talking to an agent about my career and I mentioned all these things that I've done <clears throat> and he kind of looked at me and he said, Oh, okay. So like you're kind of a Jack of all trades. And, uh, you know, I took that, that was not a compliment. Um, and, and it's interesting because in this industry, at least it used to be that, um, you know, you were supposed to do one thing and, and that was your thing. So if you were the, the guy who made scary horror movies or you were the guy who made war documentaries or you were the, you know, the guy who, you know, like Michael Moore went around with a camera and told personal, but that was your thing. You had a brand. And, and I think part of it was that it made it, well, one thing, it made it much easier for agents to, to sell you because, you know, you were that person. Um, but also, um, you know, it's sort of just the way that it seemed like the business worked. Um, you couldn't really draw outside the lines that, you know, of the space you were, the box you were put into or that you put yourself into. And I feel like that may have changed a little. It may be changing a little because um, I think versatility in this business is really useful (laughs) you know and uh, like what you know if you're if the movie business starts drying up but you also make documentaries or you are really good at you know doing podcasts or whatever that really helps and if you're if the podcast business dries up and you're but you're you're really good at commercials like you know so I've always had this sort of diverse portfolio that has allowed me to kind of keep going and to keep having um, success 
and be able, and being able to survive, uh, you know, as a creator, uh, I've been able to get by for, you know, 30 some odd years and make a living and have a family and still be able to make documentaries, but make other things too. And having that diverse portfolio of skills has, I think has been really important in my career because I've gotten to do a lot of really interesting things and, um, and also to be able to adapt when times change. And I've seen some of my other friends, you know, who are maybe do one thing or focused more, more narrowly. I've seen them struggle at times because, um, the industry is always changing, you know, like, you know, in 2020, people stopped going to the movie theater, you know, um, that, you know, in 2023 streamers stopped buying documentaries, um, you know, in, in the 2000 teens commercials started becoming much less important because of the internet and people weren't watching TV as much. So brands weren't making as many commercials or spending as much on them. So it's, it's, it's the sands are always shifting. And in my case, having that, that the broad set of experiences has been helpful. Did you ever find that you were kind of having to cobble your career together and like finding ways to like stay creative? Because I know that um, people have told me that like they've said that you know, you're just going to have to find ways for people to pay you to be creative. Like I know I've, I've been like, I've done conferences. I've recorded like teen conferences. I've done, you know, um, interviews at MIT. I'm this job right now with Tufts. I'm kind of, and that's kind of how I'm, you know, making a career for myself and building my portfolio. So do you kind of feel that um, you being well-versed in so many spheres of film and media is is related to that or were you just like I'm interested in this aspect I want to try it and see where it takes me probably a little of both I mean I definitely have done the the hustle and tried everything you know had to do all kinds of things from like you know similar to you like shooting something for someone taking pictures for somebody you know just doing all kinds of things to make a living not to mention the things I done outside of media like I was a bike messenger I worked in a bookstore I worked in a bakery I worked as a teacher you know like there were early on I did all kinds of things as I was getting my footing um because it's not an easy business to get into you know um but there was also just this level of curiosity that I've had where I've, I just wanted to I didn't ever want to just do one thing you know I felt I was, maybe I have FOMO, you know, like for everything. Cause I, I feel like I've always wanted to like, I do one thing and I do it well and I have success. And then I'm like, I want to try something different, you know, like I don't want to just do the same thing again. So, um, you know, that's, I think that is part of it. It's like, I, I just, I'm always curious of like, what would that be like to do that kind of thing? So, um, I've just done it, you know, and, even like I've even done some reality shows like you know I did the show I directed the show Queer Eye um and uh that was great it was a great experience you know it was like this that show the original I directed the original first season of the original show and that was in 2004 I think and you know that show you were probably too young to remember but that show blew up and it was like you know, on the cover of every magazine. And we were like, suddenly like we had like fans on set, like waiting to get autographs at every shoot. And, you know, being a part of something like that was really exciting. And then when it was done and I was done, when I was done with it and I had had enough, I was like, okay, what's the next thing? I want to do something different now. You know, I could have said like, oh, now I'm going to try to make another show like this or work on another show like this. But I just, you know, I, I had done that and I was ready to try something really different. So. So 
okay. I guess I'll ask you next about um, It's a Hard Knock Life and Fetch with Ruff Ruffman because those are two pieces of media that really stuck with me. Like when I was a kid, I really wanted to be on <laughs> Fetch with Ruff Ruffman, but you know, I was never going to like ask my parents. They would have been like, what are you talking about? We're, you're not going to get out. Like that wouldn't have even like crossed their minds. But I, Wait, you, you I grew up just outside of Boston. Um, yeah. I am, uh, and because uh, yeah, you were right down the street from the the studio where we filmed. Really, I mean, it was in Cambridge, but I mean, in Brighton, Brighton. Oh wow, okay, yeah, I I lived in Brighton for a couple months over the summer. I wanted to ask you about um, what um, you were creating these projects, kind of from the perspective of a child, more or less. In both projects, you know, you were working um with um children for it's a hard knock life you know documenting their careers in this huge broadway show um i can imagine that would be difficult you know um (laughs) getting not not getting children to cooperate that's not the right term but you know it's hard i mean sometimes it's hard to like get children to like not look at the camera and you know but i feel like regardless Specifically with It's the Hard Knock Life, you were able to capture such, like, poignant shots and messages from children. And I was wanting to know, like, was that just the talent itself? Or did you find that there was a lot of preparation involved with that? Like, how did you prepare for working with um, children? I mean, you can talk about either Fetch with Ruff Ruffman or It's the Hard Knock Life. Either would be um, interesting to hear about. Sure. Well, I can talk about both. So... With Fetch with Ruff Ruffman, you know, that was a PBS kids show, and we had a cast of, I'm trying to remember how many kids were in the cast, but, you know, one of the things we had on set was, like, a kid wrangler, you know? So we had we had someone full-time who was there to entertain them in between takes, to play with them, to keep them busy, to keep them focused, you know, so, so that when we were ready to roll, we could really, um, you know focus in and and not waste time because you know you when you you have a crew of you know I don't know how many I forget how many 30 40 people on the crew and they're all getting they're all on the clock and you know if the kids slow us down uh, or when we don't make our day that's incredibly expensive because you're paying all those people so um, you have to hit the schedule so it was worth it to invest in having a kid wrangler um, all the time. And, you know, for a documentary, like it's the hard knock life where we were, we were following the, um, the revival of Annie on Broadway. And, you know, it was, it came back to Broadway and we followed for a year. And some of the kids we focused in on were the, the kids who were cast to be the orphans. And so some of them were new, had never you know, been in on Broadway before. And so this was like a new experience for them. And so we were following that experience. And with that, you know, it was just, you just have to be patient. But with a documentary, you're not really asking people to perform. You know, you're asking them to be themselves. So if one of the kids who like one of the kids was really distractible and and she was young and she you know but that was part of the charm of her as a person and so we just you know whatever happened in front of the camera we rolled on it and you know with documentary you can you that sort of how I like to work is to to observe and to see what happens and and uh in this case it was it it worked really well. I, when it's it's harder and higher pressure when you're doing, um, you know, a a TV show like Fetch, where the kids have to perform, they have to hit their marks, they have to, you know, um, and you have a big crew, and so you don't you can't afford to not make your day. Um, so, yeah, that was definitely harder, and. Um, but, you know, those kids were cast and a lot of them had experience. They had been on camera before, some of them. So that made it easier. 
I'm I'm very curious. How did you initially get approached to do um, it's the hard knock life? Is it was it already with your ties with PBS or did somebody reach out to you? Yeah, it was I. So I had pretty deep ties with PBS. I had done a lot of work for WGBH, and then I had moved to New York City, uh, and that's where WNET is. And I knew folks there, and they approached me and said, "Hey, we have this film we want to make." Um, it was already funded, believe it or not, which is a rare occurrence. And it was, you know, they knew what they wanted it to be to some degree. It was, um, they knew they wanted it to be about Annie um, and Annie coming back to Broadway. And we, we knew we had about a year before opening night. And we decided, I forget how it came about, but over early on, we decided that we would make the film about one number in the play. And part of that was to focus the narrative, you know, because we wanted to focus in on one thing. So we decided, let's focus in on It's the Hard Knock Life, that song and that number. And then let's see how that evolves from ca- from the day of casting to opening night. And... And the other reason that we decided to take that approach is it's a lot cheaper um, to clear rights for one song than for all the songs. So uh, we there were there were creative reasons and practical reasons for that decision. That's really that's really cool to hear about. Um, like I said, I remember like. <laughs> So I grew up in dance. My sisters and I were do- to dance for many, many years of our lives. And I remember, like, I would go to my sister's dance competitions, and there was, like, a, a dance school who did that number. And so I was like, oh, I became obsessed with the song, and then I looked it up, and then I somehow found your documentary on YouTube. Um, I don't know. It's probably Somebody probably ripped it and put it on YouTube, but I remember watching it, and then I watched it over and over and over again. So there's, like... There was like a solid year where I was just really fixated on that documentary. And so when Howard told me about you and I looked you up again and I was like, okay, that was him. He made that documentary. And so I was just like fully taken aback and I was like really – it felt like a full circle moment to me. Um, but um, – That's I so cool. You, I, yeah. you know, I, it's funny because I, um, I feel like not that many people saw that film. And I and I think it's one of my better films. I mean, I get, I think the actually the link on YouTube. I think it might be down now, but I think that okay. link had over a million views. No, yeah, it was viral. All of my theater friends know about it. They're like, "What? You're talking to the guy who made It's the Hard Knock Life?" And they're I was like, "I know, yeah, and yeah." It's specifically people I know who do musical theater who that was a formative part of their childhood. It's funny because last night I was out. I went to a screening of this documentary called still it's about michael j fox um it's on apple plus now and it's it's a great film but i saw um i ran into a producer there um julie anderson who was my producer on it's the hard knock life and we were talking about it last night and just talking about oh that was such a good film like You know, it should have gotten more attention than it did, but it was, it was really, it was such a fun experience to um, spend time, you know, with these, one, with these kids who were, you know, on Broadway and learning how to be Broadway stars, and two, to spend time with the, the amazing creatives who were the creatives behind the show, like James Lapine, uh, and Andy Blankenbuehler, who you know, choreographed Hamilton and um, David Corrins, who did the set design for Hamilton and Susan Hilferty, who did the costume design for Wicked. And all these people came together to to make this Broadway show come together. And they were like all creatively brilliant. And we got to just watch them work for a year and, um, you know, create this this thing out of nothing. And that was very exciting. Yeah, I think that, like, although I didn't end up sticking with dance, I think that why that documentary resonated with me so much was because it highlighted the, like, Broadway aspect. And then a few years later, I ended up doing stage crew in high school, and to this day, I still do some stage handing. 
um, specifically in the concert venue um, realm, but I have a huge love for musical theater and plays as well, and I feel like that documentary was very formative. So although it didn't necessarily give get the reach that you may have liked, I, it has profoundly impacted me. So thank you for making it. Amazing. Um, kind of like the last subject I wanted to touch on was that many of your subjects in your documentaries are people who've have experienced like grave tragedies. They're, they have dark undertones and they're very intense subject matters. And you only meet these subjects for a brief amount of time. And who knows, maybe you still stayed in touch with a lot of them. I'm specifically thinking of the many sad fates of Mr. Toledano. Um, I'm not sure if you still stayed in touch with, um, with him. But um, I was wondering, how do you reconcile feeling like connected to your subjects and striking a bond with them because obviously you've developed trust with all of them only for that production to end like what do you do do you feel like as like bereft in a, in a way or is it kind of like you've you've had closure in making the film with them that's a great question um and it's it's case by case but you know i'll tell you like mr toledano that guy phil toledano who you know was a photographer and I made a documentary about this one project that he did where he imagined all the ways that he might die because he was very focused on his own mortality. And I spent three years with him, you know, following him around doing this project. And yeah, we became very close. And, you know, funny enough, I knew him from Tufts. So that's how I connected with him. And I was walking down the street one day in New York and I ran into him and he told me about this project he was doing. And that, that's how that film came about, uh, was just from a coincidence of running into him. But, you know, every once in a while, we'll, we'll email each other and say hi, but it is weird. It's, it's like you, it's like, it's like having a relationship with somebody when you make a film with them. I mean, it is having a relationship with them. And, you know, sometimes you see them every day for weeks or months or even years. And and then when the film's over, you sort of decide, like, are they going to still be in my life or not? And, you know, I try to stay in touch with people and because they're a part of my life now once I make a film with them. So um, that's, you know, there's, it's funny, I I made one of my first films was um, called Taking on the Kennedys. And it was about a guy who ran for US Congress against Ted Kennedy's son, Patrick. And this guy's name was Kevin Vigilante. And, you know, I hadn't talked with him in a few years. And the other day, we just texted with each other. And we're gonna, we're gonna, wow. you know, we're gonna do a call soon and talk. So but, you know, it's, again, that this was a film I made in 1994, and I think I've only seen him, like, a couple times since then. And, you know, from seeing him every day for six months to not... Every day for six months, and then probably every day for another nine months in an edit room, you know, seeing him on a screen. So it's it really is... It becomes a part of your, your life, and you know, going, it's kind of like, uh, you know, talking to him will be like going to back to like a reunion, uh, like a high school reunion or something, you know, you, you have all these memories that you shared. uh, And, and then the experience of having a film come out with, you know, and celebrating that is really bonding. And um, yeah, it's a good question, though. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, I mean, and just wrapping up, um, I know you have to go soon. Um, I kind of have one question I ask everybody I interview, and it's what do you want people to feel or take away from your projects when they watch them? Um, I want people to feel connected. I want people to feel like we're all connected, that that. that you know, I really worry about the the times we live in, and I feel like we're not we're not connected anymore. People don't talk to each other. People people don't talk to people who are different from them, who have different points of view, who um, 
you know, maybe don't agree with them on everything. And I, I worry about that because... I think if we live in in our own bubbles and we we can do that now, it's really easy to do it. Um, you can vet people really eas- easily these days just by looking at their social media, you know, and um, that, that concerns me. And I think that films telling stories about people and sharing them with the world is a really it's a safe way for people to connect with others who maybe are different from them. And I, and so I hope that my work does that for people where they they might meet people in my stories that they wouldn't ordinarily meet in their everyday life. And maybe that will change the way they think about others, and that maybe that will help them to um, broaden their horizons and say, oh, I feel like I I know this kind of person. And maybe that will open them up a little bit more. Um, open their world world up a little bit more. That's that's what I hope for these days is trying to find ways to build bridges through storytelling and through filmmaking. For sure, and I I think that you've done a stellar job at that. I'm very impressed with your work and everything you've done. And yeah, I mean that's all that's all the questions I had for you. I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to add or plug or like how people can still follow your work, consume it, stay in touch with you? Yeah, um, well, I'm on Instagram. So <laughs> if people want to reach out to me, feel free. And um, um, I, oh, the, well, and the other thing is I'm working on a project now that I wondered if you had a connection to it. It's it's about Hakeem Olajuwon. Uh, do you know who he is? I'm not familiar. Okay. Sounds Nigerian, though. <laughs> He's a Nigerian basketball player who okay. was uh, was sort of at his height a little before you were born, I think. But I wonder if your parents might know, uh, might have followed him. I'll mention it to him, them. I'm sure they'll be interested. Yeah, I'd be curious to know if you let me know if they, if they um, remember if they remember him. Okay, I definitely will. Wait, could you just spell his name? Yeah, it's H A K E E M. And then O L A J U W O N. I'll mention that name. Yeah, let me know. Let me know if they have memories of him or know others who felt a real connection to him because that's what our film is about. It's about the. It's about his fans. Wow. Yeah, I'm. I'm so excited to hear about to watch that when it comes out. No, that's that's great. Thanks so much for listening to this week's episode of Would You Give Me a Stage Hand. If you could please write a review and rate this podcast, that would be great and um, amazing for um, my life prospects. Also, I have a substack. It is cinematics.substack.com. There I post photographs and music and some of my own writing and other art I like. Um, So if you're interested, subscribe. And just as a button, I did ask my parents if they knew who Hakeem Olajuwon was. And my mom said, and I quote, he reigned supreme in the 90s, unquote. And I don't know, I think it's sometimes cool to get a little glimpse of what my parents' pop cultural intake was growing up. Because honestly, sometimes it's a mystery to me. So yeah. Thank you for listening and I will see you guys next time.